that time of my life was very much like I put my head down. I just put my head down. I just, I just did the work. Really, I just kind of got a two and a half year lesson on everything that I shouldn't have done in business. So it was the greatest thing I ever did. We're viral in Tunisia. I'm like, Tunisia? Like, what? You know, like, oh, we're in, uh, we're, we're viral in Romania. We're viral in, you know, like, uh, Puerto Rico. Like, just random little pockets of the world. If the whole app is just about sharing. Then as long as somebody shares the app, it's going to keep growing. Hunter. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. It has been an absolute pleasure um, to meet you over the last five minutes. Thank I think you. podcasts are hilarious. I appreciate that. You meet somebody and like five minutes later, you're in a deep conversation with them. But that's what we're here to do. Absolutely, bro. Thank you again. For... It's a it's a pleasure to be here. Um, friends of mine have met you and said great things. So it'll be a good combo. I'm well, excited. those friends also are the reason why we're connected here. They suggested you were somebody that I needed to talk to and and learn more about your story. And I, I like to just roll right into it. Let's Most it. people know you for building the NGL app, Yeah, but it started with an app called Leader. Mm -hmm. What was that like? You were 19, 18 years old building that. Let's start at the beginning of the story. You know, I was funny. I, you, you did say you did your homework and you did. Um, Leader is a deep cut. I uh, That was my first app. It was, you know, the way I describe it is it was basically like Gen Z Foursquare. Mm -hmm. And I I thought I had, I thought it was my billion dollar business. I was like, I was 17, 18. I was like, this is it. I'm going to be a billionaire before I'm 22. I'm going to be like Mark Zuckerberg. And I'm going to drop out of college and, and build this app. And really, I just kind of got a two and a half year lesson on everything that I shouldn't have done in business. So it was the greatest thing I ever did because I just failed for two and a half years. And I failed when I was really young. So it was, it was like, you know, it was kind of cute that I was failing, right? I was this 18 year old kid. And um, yeah, that app was it, was, it was, it was really where I learned all my lessons, I'll be honest with you. And it was, it was, uh, it was a great experience. What are some of those lessons for somebody listening? Yeah. Cause people know you for being in that app space. I'm mm -hmm. sure they're gonna click on this video and wanna learn certain things. What were some of the lessons you learned in that beginning stages? Um, do not outsource development under any circumstances. Do not do it. Um, I learned that the hard way. If you're going to build stuff, make sure that you talk to people who know how to build stuff because, you know, you shouldn't really hide from those experts. And I think that I resisted reaching out to people that could have very much accelerated that two and a half year process. Uh, and a lot of it was maybe my own imposter syndrome, my own worry that what I, what I was building was not valuable, that was not the right thing. And I think that there's like a level of emotionless that you have to get to when it comes to business. And your first business is where you put all your emotion into and you put all that like blood, sweat and tears mentally and emotionally. And you're like, oh, I want it to work. And then you realize that business is really just like shoveling shit and failing. So, you know, if you can just kind of be non-emotional about it and just like, hey, I'm here to build a product. I'm here to build a solution to a problem. If it fails, who cares, right? If it fails, I say it's like, it's good for your portfolio, right? Nobody really cares that it's a failure when you've succeeded once. You could have, you know, 10, 20, 30 failures. It, does, it doesn't matter. And I, like I said, I did my homework. I watched the YC application video. No way. <laughs> oh my God. I did. That's funny. What was it like to try and apply to YC at such an early age? You know, it's fucked because I didn't get in. <laughs> and uh, I, I think I think I should have, but it wasn't it wasn't in the cards. It was funny because I, I really, it was a massive dream of mine. I really wanted to be in YC. I thought that it was like, you know, I mean, it still is. It's very, very yeah. prestigious. It's a big deal. And uh, I talked to a bunch of people who had gotten in and all that stuff, but yeah, I, I, I think I applied I think once or twice. I applied to other accelerators. I didn't get into any accelerators. Um, that's another thing I learned. It's like yeah, accelerators are good, but like you don't always need them. I think they're good they're good though if you do get in, but it's not gonna make or break it. I, and for me it, it definitely didn't break it. You got the taste for building apps. Mm -hmm. You targeted college students next. Yep. Zoom University, a double dating app mm -hmm. was your your next play. Why college students and why double dating? That's like a pretty deep niche there. It's niche. Yeah. So um, I wish I could say it was my idea. It was not my idea. It was a good friend of mine's idea. And I was, I had just come off the back of leader really like just being, being kind of done because COVID wrecked it. Um, can't go anywhere. Can't pick up points anywhere. There's no app. 
So I basically just got an opportunity and it shows you just kind of right place, right time. I I had reached out to this guy a couple months prior uh, while I was still building leader and just kind of like, you know, we went to this, we went to the same school. He had dropped out, raised a bunch of money, was kind of like living the life that I wanted to live in a sense, just kind of like he was a couple years ahead of me. And I reached out to him and uh, he and his, and his partner and, and they became friends of mine. So a couple months later, their app had also kind of gotten fucked by COVID and they were pivoting and they posted, I'll never forget it. My buddy, my buddy, Daniel, um, shout out Daniel. He posted a, a thing on Instagram. He's like, I need a designer for a new app that I'm building. And I was like, I'll do it. Like I'm, I'm in, like I had no money at that point. Like I, I, I was dead broke. All my money was in leader. It was over. And you know, my, uh, my, I don't, didn't have a trust fund. There was no money there. I was like, fuck, I gotta go back to school. Like, I don't want to go back to school. Like I can't, I can't be a failure. And, um, I, I reached out to him and I was like, I'll do it. And within about 24 hours, we were shipping the app. Like it was like a day later. Um, and it was, uh, you asked why colleges, it was because the younger that you skew, the more close friends that you have. So if you're wanting to build a social app, you're wanting to build anything that spreads very organically and virally, you have to look at like who has the most social connections. It's generally college kids, high school kids, middle school kids. Um, and Zoom University was one of those right place, right time because, you know, all the college kids go from going to parties to now there's no parties. They all want to meet each other. Double dating is was great because uh, girls are more comfortable with their friend. Yep. So we had a seven to one girl to guy ratio, which was crazy. <laughs> um, but that's Zoom University. Yeah. Yeah, and I, actually, when reading it, like I looked at the niche and I thought it was a great idea because I do agree, girls are more comfortable with a friend. Totally. And the people that would be using that would most likely be the people in fraternities and sororities who have their social events taken away. Yeah. So I looked at that and I was like, this is actually like a really great idea. It made sense. It, it made a lot of sense at the time. Um, you know, I, I think that the app, it, it did what it was supposed to do. You know, it kind of like, it, it brought me from like, I had this, this big L and then I had this like moderate W I'd say, um, you know, it didn't really make any money, but it went viral and it went top 10 on the app store. It kind of got me, it got me hooked. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like, I, I needed that like little bite to be like, okay, this is, this is possible. Like, I could actually do this. So uh, it was a very fun experience. I tell you that. Yeah, and then you parlayed that into getting some consulting gigs for Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. And at least from what I read, the main charter for you when you did do that was help them reach a younger audience. Mm -hmm. Totally. How did that play out? I saw you had some really big names on that list. Mm -hmm. What was it like working with some of those brands? And what were some of the results that came from the work you did? So it was it was a it was a great experience. I'm glad that I did it because, you know, when I was flashback, when I was 17, I wanted to, I thought I wanted to be an international business consultant. And then I did an internship in that right before I built leader, realized I don't want to be a consultant. I want to build apps. And then now I, this was kind of 2020 after zoom. You was like, okay, well, you know what? I've done apps. Let me try taking the skill set, bringing, going back to consulting. Uh, consulting is not fun. Hmm. Working with big brands is a challenge because you really are not able to change anything. And my whole thing is like, well, I want to change the color. I don't like that thought. I don't like the way that looks. This should be like this. And it was just a lot of levels of like, well, we got to get marketing to approve that. We got to get this person to approve that. And I was like, you know, I really love working with these brands and I've worked with some amazing companies and and, uh, and it was a great experience, but it, it definitely showed me, no, I want to do startups or do my own thing. I don't want to be a, a small cog in a big machine. I want to just own my own life. So I, 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 I kind of, I then went back to apps. And like, I mean, obviously you just said some of the things that you learned from that. What was it like? Like, what did it feel like to not be able to do those things? Cause one thing is to realize it, but what was it like? What did it feel like when you weren't able to make those changes, even though you knew that that was probably what was right. Oh, bro, it's so frustrating, right? Because I'm telling these companies, like, listen, you want to reach younger people, you got to do this, and they're like, oh, I don't know about that. So it was, it was, I felt very handicapped, and I think that it's, it was, it was definitely something that I'm, I'm glad I did because I wanted to experience that corporate level, but not like actually work a job, mm -hmm. um, in the corporate level. So this kind of like scared me away from that completely. And brought me to where I was like, no, no, I'm just going to stay in startups. I'm going to stay in apps. Eventually, it's going to work. Um, and it just kind of, it just took more time. 
And at this point, you're two two apps in. Yeah. You've now worked and found out what you didn't like. What are some of the biggest takeaways from that portion of your journey? Things that you look back and you can go back and attribute that to some of the reasons why you're successful right now. You know, some of the things I learned in that time, it was like um, I'd, I'd learned, and this was an ongoing lesson, I'd learned I should build simple things, right? That was the key for me. And I think that it was like this this like boomerang back of just like two completely different realities of building the first app, it's super complicated, doesn't catch on, it's like hard to build, I'm focusing on the wrong things, being too obsessive over like pixel perfect design, and then going to like a super rugged, janky Zoom U that went super viral, but it was a really simple product. So I think that was like the the main thread that I realized very early on and, and through friends of mine and, and, and peer mentors and later mentors, I kind of just learned, you know, hey, build something that just meets this specific demand and focus on that and don't overcomplicate it. And, you know, the the experience of leader to Zoom you was really like it was a great two different realities very quickly so I can understand, OK, here's what I don't do. Here's what I do. Yeah, no. And I think that's great. And I always like interviewing my guests in chronological order. Because I always think it's really cool to like see the wins continue to compound. One thing leads to another, which leads to another. So you have these three successes right now, two applications, consultant, consulting for some of these big companies. You learn what you do and you don't like. You then get recruited to Nine Count, which is a consumer social holding company created by Alex Hoffman is the name, the former president of Musical.ly. Mm -hmm. What is a consumer social holding company? So basically when I joined Nine Count, they were not a holding company yet. But when I joined them, they were basically a small team of people led by Alex, who became my first mentor. And a lot of them were from Musical.ly, former Musical.ly employees that had made a lot of money from the acquisition to ByteDance. Um, it was a billion dollar acquisition. And it was basically like I was kind of joining like a like a well-oiled machine. And I was joining uh, because they had seen my success at ZoomU. They knew that I was a great designer. You know, I, I kind of started as a founder, realized, with, hey, I'm not that great of a founder yet. Let me get some experience. And, you know, I remember listening to Evan Spiegel and, and Brian Chesky uh, of Snapchat and Airbnb talking about being design CEOs, being product CEOs. So I was like, you know what? Okay, let me just be a designer and be a product person. Let me get really good experience doing that. And Nine Count was very much that experience for me. When we started, it was just one app we were focused on, which was Wink, which became the largest uh, Snapchat friend finder. And then I slowly started building more apps and we kind of just rolled them up into this one big hold co and I'm no longer there and, and not involved, but they're they're crushing and they're doing great. And it's, it's great to see that the apps are still doing fantastic. Yeah. And I had that written down, like during that time you built 10 apps, shipped five, Mm -hmm. What was it like going from two applications in uh, a few years to like, hey, now we're building 10 apps in this accelerated pace, shipping them out. There's people backing it. Yeah. What was the difference from that to that experience? Oh, dude, it was like night and day. I look at those that kind of that that time of my life was very much like I put my head down. I just put my head down. I just I just did the work and I got the experience and it was very like. It was, it was like the, it was the big leagues. That's how I looked at it. Like this, okay, all right, there's money behind this. There's, you know, tens of millions of VC dollars behind this. I'm working with experts. I'm working with people who are already successful. I'm working with people who are where I want to be. I have to now just be like the best I could possibly be, um, which is why, yeah, I designed 10 apps at nine count. We shipped five of them. Um, a couple of them did pretty well. And yeah, dude, it, it was, it was just go time, honestly, is how I looked at it. Like, I think that there's, there's times in like people's careers are just like, when you're just like in the trenches and you're like, all right, I got to pay my dues. And I looked at it as like nine count was like, I am paying my dues and I am, you know, learn and be a, a valuable member of this, of this organization and learn what it takes to actually build this kind of business by just working in it. What was your favorite one to build out of all 10 of those? My favorite one I ever built, it was called, uh, it was called Juju and, uh, it, it got shut down by Apple, unfortunately, but it was really good. It was a game, it was a gaming app and mm -hmm. the way it would work, it was like you, you and someone else would match, um, and you would have a voice chat that would open up and then you'd play like 
hyper casual games with one another. And then you'd exchange Snapchats. And it was great. And I loved it. And it had probably some of the best foundational metrics I've ever seen, it's literally to this day. Um, like it, it, ha it had just crazy metrics. And then unfortunately, you know, we violated some terms. So Apple was like, can't do that. I was like, ah, oh, all right. But it's one of my favorite apps still. And I love the design of it. What is it like? working with Apple and kind of being at their beg and call when it comes to what you create and mm -hmm. what you put out. Cause it's gotta be a little scary knowing that somebody could turn your revenue off like that from oh, yeah. day to the, one day to the next. You know, working with Apple, I'll tell you, there's some really good things about it, which is all the payment processing, all of the, you know, refunds, all of the infrastructure is fully covered. So you don't really have to worry about any of that stuff. Um, and you know, there's also benefit of like, there's, it's the only industry that can grow at this level of speed because every single person has the app store on their phone. So, you know, you, you, you get the good, but then you deal with like, there's a big tax that they put on you yeah. and you are subject to a certain, you know, terms and, and things that you cannot violate, which, you know, it, it's, it's good and bad, but it's like, it's a trillion dollar monopoly, the biggest company in the world. I you can't fight them. No. So, you know, all, all I can do is kind of play in that sandbox and, you know, make money in that sandbox, which, you know, Facebook is subject to their laws. Instagram is Snapchat, Airbnb, you know, WhatsApp. Everybody is subject to Apple's laws. It's like, you know, it's not just it's not just me. It's other multi-billion dollar businesses. Yeah, it's a fair playing field. It's what it is. And it's funny, I'm I'm watching on Netflix right now the Uber documentary. Mm -hmm. It came out in like 2021, but I never noticed it or saw it. Yeah. And like now I gotta I'm watch watching that. it. I haven't seen that. It, it's pretty good. I'm like halfway through and it's interesting to see Travis like mm. kind of unfold into this like somewhat psychopath yeah. of like a founder. And he's going to battle with Apple in mm -hmm. like the middle of this right now on like He's doing some stuff on the back end he shouldn't be, mm -hmm. but he's also pushing the like, we're the number one app in the app store. They wouldn't fuck with us type of conversation. So yeah. it's funny that we talk about that because I know people are generally upset at Apple or annoyed because of the fees and things, yeah. but it's fair for everybody. You know, it's, it's what it is for everybody. So I think that it's a system that I believe will change. I just don't think it's going to change anytime soon. I think on the medium to long term, I see the opening up. I mean, a lot of a lot of EU regulation going on right now. There's a Supreme Court case that we're waiting on. There's some interesting things going on in apps that you know, like are really you know, could be very impactful on the on just the freeing up of a lot of different regulation, which I think would be great. So, I mean, yeah, we'll see. But uh, it's it's definitely there's no other kind of business that can reach as many people as quickly as apps it's just 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 no i there's no other business that can do that yeah and, and i mean we've been i feel like we're relatively similar in age and yeah we grew up like we were getting just old enough when mm -hmm. iphones came out and app stores yeah and still to this day i go in the app store and i click and i see like the number one game at the moment mm -hmm. And the amount of reviews and oh, yeah. downloads, it just blows my mind that there's that many people on the app store like doing stuff. It's it's wild. And I mean, there's there is so many submissions to the app store every single day. It is it is absolutely crazy. And it's like, but really when you look at, you know, the the, the highest level of playing field, it's really only about a hundred teams that are competing. It's actually a very small amount of people. So it's like what what I love about apps is it's like it's this pure meritocracy where the only way you're going number one on the app store is you build something that is genuinely extremely viral. Yeah. There is no cheat code. There is You cannot run ads to go number one. The, the the metrics to just get to that point are so hard to achieve. The only way you can do it is if like, I package my pixels and my software a little bit better than this other app that did it. And I used certain growth hacks and certain you know, strategies that made it all work together. So it's it's this purely competitive environment that I think, you know, it definitely turns a lot of people off because it's 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 very hard. And it's a business that's very much built on like failing over and over and over again. And then, oh my God, it worked. And then go back to failing and then it'll work again. 
Yeah, and I think that's a good segue into the point that I wanted to make here. And we've gone through, uh, let's call it halfway through your story, because yep. I'll count the next big win as like, yeah. it counts as like 50%. It was it, a big it, win. It definitely does. I agree. Yeah. Walk us through what it's like to, to actually create a viral app. I think people that are going to mm-hmm. click on this video would be interested to know from somebody who's in the trenches, because from an outsider looking in, mm-hmm. I couldn't even begin to philosophize what it would be like to launch an app. Mm-hmm. What does that process look like from start to finish? So the process really it starts with like a lot of ideation. So it's really like you got to come up with a concept. You have to kind of mull over it over and over in your head and really kind of iron out a, a user journey. So like, what is my user going to do? What am I going to get from them? Am I going to get their name? Am I going to get their phone number? Am I going to get their Instagram handles? Okay, what are they going to give, you know, what what, what am I going to give them? Am I going to give them dopamine? Am I going to give them followers? Is it going to be, you know, like, am I creating a cool photo for them? Like, you have to come up with like, what is, what am I giving? What am I getting? And that's really important. It's something I think people don't really talk about enough is, is that's really what this is. It's, it's a, it's an exchange, right? I'm giving you dopamine on this app and then you're going to share it with your best friend and then they're going to get some dopamine and they're going to share with their best friend. So that's like foundational principles. I I always start there. Um, And then a lot of design work. um, That's kind of the next stage I'd say is it's just a lot of design work and ironing out a flow and making it really good and, you know, going on Figma and spending time there doing some prototyping. Uh, And then I just go right into just like front end. So you'll, you know, depending on the language, you know, if you build it in Swift UI, then, you know, that's just going to be iOS. Um, you build it in React Native, you can go across platform. So then that's really where I, I, I'll bring in my, my engineers. Um, I'm, a, I'm a front-end engineer, but I much prefer to just be a product lead and run design, run product, run marketing. But if I need to get in the trenches on the code, I will get in the trenches on the code. It's just my engineering skills and my product skills, my product skills, let's say, are higher than my engineering skills. Um, but that's that process. And then you really just build it. And then it's about submitting to the app store. And uh, you generally get approved after your first, maybe like one or two rejections, they'll approve you. So you got to keep resubmitting. And like, what do yeah. you typically get rejected for? You know, uh, you're missing a privacy policy on this page. Hey, you need to have the restore purchase mm-hmm. button. You know, just shit you just forget about. Like, yeah. oh, okay, you're right. That's I got to do that. And, you know, it, it's it's generally like a, it's like a nerve wracking process, but it's it's not really nerve wracking. You're, you're going to get accepted as long as you're abiding by the rules. Yeah. And would you say, because you, you touched on it at the beginning, is kind of the way to blow up an app. It has to be something shareable. Yeah, it has to peer-to-peer sharing seems yes. like the way to go to really blow something up. Yeah, that's the only way. You have to build something that can organically be shared. And um, I learned that from really the experience at Wink. Um, and you know, it was a running off Snapchat, so we would just get all of these free organic downloads every day coming from Snapchat. So I was like, you know, that's that's the hack. Like there's, there, there, I have to have a constant influx of new people. So, uh, I'd say that, yeah, if you're building an app, make sure you figure out how, how can person A bring person B and they bring person C and so on and so forth. That's really where you get like, that's like step one. And I think that a lot of people skip that one. So they build products that don't work. Yeah. And I I like, I I think about companies that have gone viral through sharing and, and through certain things like that. And a funny one that just came to my mind as we're chatting is Silly Bands. You remember Silly Bands? You remember Silly Bands? Like, Wars. you had the different animal or the different shape. And, like, I got to school and I was like, yo, I'll trade you this one for that one. Yeah. But it just created this, like, constant. Same thing with, it like, is. mood rings. Like, yes. mood rings when you were little. Dude, oh, yeah. it's just, like, seeing somebody else with something. And I think it's some of those companies and they're not there anymore. Like, yeah. it ended. What is it like? How hard is it to stay viral, stay relevant, like continue to be used after that initial massive spike of sharing? Bro, really hard, <laughs> really hard. Um, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I feel very lucky that you know a, a few of my apps are still around and still spitting out you know the same amount of money they were they were years ago. That's it's it's crazy because it's really hard. I think that what you mostly see is yeah, you'll see apps blow up see them have their, you know, 15 minutes and everybody will use them. And generally they don't figure out how to monetize. So they, you know, raise VC dollars until they can't. 
and they generally raise at valuations that are just ridiculously high that you you know you know B real is an example it's, it's that company's not worth half a billion dollars and that's what they raised at so you know I I, I saw all these traps because I was in the industry I, I saw this and uh I, I looked at it as like I I wanted to build things that could always stay viral because the entire app was just a funnel to share so if the whole app is just about sharing then as long as somebody shares the app it's going to keep growing and you know ngl was that app that really just just kept growing yeah and at be real it's funny that you mentioned that yeah. one that one had like three weeks of of stardom where yeah. it's like hey you got to be on be real yeah. post it and then my friends, I started getting the notification, like, your friend posted. And I was like, I don't really give a shit. Like, on to the next. Care. Yeah. NGL, you just mentioned it. That's the big win. Mm -hmm. I think it's like 100 million plus downloads at this yeah. point. Where did that come from? And it's funny, the, when I read the description of it, I loved it. Mm -hmm. Because, again, playing back to our generation, Ask FM was the shit back in the day. You went on Ask FM, you wrote all your stuff. You kind of built the Ask FM for the generation right under us and tied it to their favorite app, Instagram. Yeah. And especially Instagram stories, which when that released, there's been reels, there's been videos. I don't think anything had the virality of Instagram stories Absolutely. and taking people from, you get to see 30 moments of my life every year because I make 30 posts to yeah. now you get to see my daily life. Yeah. Where did the idea come from and what was it like building that? So it was one of those, once again, right place, right time, right friends, right skill set. Um, I had positioned and kind of cemented myself prior to NGL as like, I was the designer. Like, I was the product guy. If you needed good product, come to me. If you needed good design, come to me. Um, I got a call from a friend of mine, uh, my friend Isaiah, and he basically just called me and he's just like, I have an idea for an app get on a zoom call in two minutes. I'm going to tell you about it. I need you to design it. Um, I'll bring you as, in as a co-founder equal split. I was like, okay, bet let's do it. And I get on a phone call with him and the other co-founders. And it was just kind of like, we all, we all knew that there was this incredible opportunity because it was the same day that Instagram had launched the feature for everybody to post links. And so we all got together and we were like, okay, the product is anonymous Q and A for Instagram. Everyone's going to be doing this. We thought. Yeah. We thought we need to build this in three weeks. We need to get this out because every single team is going to do this. Like we're going to have so much competition. So we that's what we thought. We built the app in three weeks. We launched it. Crickets. Nobody. Not a single competitor. Nobody. For six months, it was quiet. The app was basically a dud for over four months um but i knew it would work and it's weird because i look back on it and i knew that it would work and i knew the entire time it would work because I, I i looked at the first principles of it you know i i looked at like okay well this is going to automatically grow because it's instagram this is going to go super viral this has got the the gossip it's juicy it's 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 you know teens love anonymous apps and it's also got the the beauty of it is that it's like it's not like a a platform it's a tool so I knew that it was going to work. It was just, it took us about six months of carefully crafting the share flow, making sure people understood, hey, you got to copy the link, then you got to copy the asset, then you got to go into Instagram, and you got to place the link, and you got to do all these things. That was the hardest part. It's just explaining to people how to go through the process of doing this because, you know, I really look at it as, you know, we trained over 100 million people on how to use links on stories. Prior to NGL, nobody really knew how to use that feature. We brought that feature to where it is today from like a from an adoption standpoint because every single teen app now uses that and they didn't before. Yeah, and it's funny. I mean, it, it's not funny. It's cool that you mentioned that and I agree. Stories were amazing, and but the features within them slowly start to like... Mm -hmm. For a while, it was the question thing, like, ask me a question. Like, that's so popular right now. Before that, when they released the stickers, it was cool to post the stickers. Like, when you went through and 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 built this, you had to go through a time of struggle. Like you said, there was four months of it being dud and you making a tweak here, a tweak mm -hmm. there. Explain to people listening, because so many people quit, yeah. like, early. Yeah. Explain to people listening how a small tweak 
can take you from dud to million downloads. Yeah. Um, the app was called ask.fun and then I changed it to NGL. So that's a pretty small tweak, just changing the name. Um, we included the, we, 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 we went from a tutorial that you could skip to a tutorial that you could not skip. And that was a small tweak that ended up being massive. Um, we, we just did a lot of really small fixes. You know, we, we, add, we, we didn't add a lot of features. We kept it really, really simple. And monetization, we just looked at apps that had come before us and what they had done and just kind of used the playbook that was, you know, on the open market in front of us to see. Um, but it was really like a lot of small things. I mean, like it was, it was copy. It was, it was like, you know, you know, the, the button should say this. It shouldn't say that. Oh, we have to add this little disclaimer here so people understand it. You know, hey, let's let's put on the website, you know, a, a line of text that says, you know, 100 percent anonymous and secure. OK, that helped because people are now more willing to send, you know, crazier messages like it was just really small things that we got from just like making a change, looking at the numbers and being like, OK, that was a good change. Let's do another one. Oh, that was a bad change. Roll it back. And it was just doing that for for months and months and months. Did the app start to slowly get downloads or was it like one week quiet next week? Holy shit. Like, I think we got the winner. So it slowly started in April of 2022 and we were, we, we just kind of been, we built the company with $10,000. Um, and we spent the majority of that money on a domain that we never used. <laughs> um, and then the other money we used to just kind of pay influencers like hundred bucks, 200 bucks, like, Hey, post NGL, post some replies, see what happens. And we paid an influencer to do that, maybe a couple hundred bucks. And then suddenly the app pops off in New Zealand. I was shocked. It was very weird. It was like, you know, by pop off, I mean like, you know, 7,000 users, not yeah. I mean crazy, but it was enough where like the Firebase was lighting up and we were, and we we're like, this is crazy. Like, oh my God, it's yeah. working. And we were making, you know, like probably made 2K that month. And that was like April or May of 2022. And we basically just used the time in New Zealand to iterate the product more. And we realized, okay, like, let's build, like that was when we put in monetization. That was when we tried different, you know, different styles on, on, the, on the social media posts. You know, we did, diff we did a lot of different shit in that time. And um, then we built Android. And I'd say it was about a week after we built the Android app, we did, deployed the Android app that we went viral. Do you think it had to do a lot with the Android Absolutely. side? Absolutely. Yes. I used to be an iPhone maxi and like hate Android. Now I love Android. I love iPhone. If you have a, if you're connected to the internet, I, that's fantastic. I love it. I, it's like, I don't need to just only be for iPhone because I, I really see that, uh, Android gave us the downloads. iPhone gave us the revenue. And with Android, I know it, it's funny. People think Apple is the biggest phone mm -hmm. just because they live here in America and they see it. But worldwide android is the biggest phone yeah and maybe it's not exactly android but it's other phones other than apple it that is. are actually the bigger phone did you see a large spike in international use oh, from yeah. the android app is that where a lot of that picked up from a lot of it you know we're we're, we're huge all over asia um all over europe we're huge uh south america we reached number one in countries that i was like <laughs> where even is this yeah. like just like with what like it was so it was the most bizarre thing i've ever someone saying like we're viral in tunisia i'm like tunisia like <laughs> what you know like oh we're in uh we're we're viral in romania we're viral in you know like uh puerto rico like just random little pockets of the world is like that's so random um yeah it was because of android and i i think that i i didn't understand the power of android because I was only really on the iOS train because, you know, 90% or roughly 90% of the U.S. teens own an iPhone. Yeah. So if you're building consumer social in the U.S., you know, you need iOS. Um, but I had kind of never had the, I'll say, the respect for Android that I did. And then after NGL, I build everything cross-platform now. I, I don't only build for iPhone anymore. Well, if somebody from Android ever listens to this podcast, you're getting a huge shout out here. Yeah, Android for the win. Oh yeah, there's a they they share those users share they download apps like you would you'd be shocked at the numbers there, especially in developing countries. You know, if you you look at uh, the MENA region, like Middle East, North Africa, 
they are fervent over there for new apps. They love new apps. And, you know, Southeast Asia, also a massive market. Like they are downloading everything and apps that are popping off in the U.S., there are people making the same versions for those markets and they're going extremely viral. You said that you turned on monetization. Obviously, it's not a charity. You got to make money off of these course. applications. Yes. What was your reason or, or what was the time where you're like, all right, it's time for monetization. And if it's something you can share, what was the strategy to monetize this? Because I mean, 100 million downloads. Yeah. Somebody listening is going to think that's a lot of money. What was the strategy to go get that money? So the strategy was really, you know, other apps in our space monetize in a very similar way that we do, where they sell premium features on a subscription. It's a weekly subscription. Um, we basically built that in before we went super viral. We were in New Zealand, kind of 7,000 users. We are like, okay, let's build the monetization. Really just looked at apps that came before us. Um, you know, that the beauty of this industry is that everybody copies each other and they copy each other publicly. So yeah. it's like, it's right there. You know, yeah. the, the playbook's in front of you. Um, so we basically just kind of looked at other apps and, and tried to make the best of, you know, of the situation and like, okay, let's take this from this app. Let's use these guys inspo from this company. Um, and I mean, yeah, hundred million downloads and you don't need that many people to, to make millions of dollars. You really don't, especially when you're dealing with subscription revenue, um, and, you know, especially weekly subscription revenue. So, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't need more than, you know, a, couple hundred thousand people to give you money before the, the the zeros start adding up yeah and you had i am just reading stuff on you it was like 150 plus million downloads and 30 million dollars worth mm -hmm. of subscription revenue mm -hmm. was that all or a majority from ngl um or i'd say more other? than 50 percent was was for ngl yeah the downloads you know the majority from ngl and then the revenue i'd say yeah like 60 percent 70 percent from ngl um and uh, yeah, now I'd say we're somewhere probably closer to like 40 million in total revenue uh, across all the apps I've built, including, you know, Wink, including some of the other apps there. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's crazy. It's a lot. And I know you're not part of the holding company that yeah. built Wink and all of those. Is that, are you still receiving revenue off those applications? And no, I'm not receiving revenue off those. Um, I, I, uh, I, I was I was a much smaller part of of the but, org chart there yeah. on the, on the equity side, um, but uh, I'm very happy that they're they're still they're still crushing it. And then NGL, it's just money coming in your pocket. And, and NGL is a is a is a gift that keeps on giving, huh. and I'm uh, I've got I've got partners that that handle the business day to day, and um, yeah, they we just keep it running. The app has not changed. The same app. It will remain the same app because beautiful. it doesn't need to change. And uh, yeah, I, I also, that's another lesson I learned was that I, I saw apps that did really well, that blew up, that had their moment, that were even making money. And then they would just add features and they would just keep adding things. And I was just like, why do you keep adding things? Like make something that just does what it's supposed to do in a simple way. Don't bog us down with all this unnecessary shit. And that was another thing with NGL. It's like, you know, I'm not going to make that mistake. I'm not going to overcomplicate this and ruin a good thing. Because, I mean, I had everybody pitching me every single way of what to turn the app into. And I didn't listen to anybody. Because I was like, no, no, no. We don't need to do that. We don't need to be adding feeds. We don't need to be doing, you know, crazy things. We're not building a social platform here. This is a tool. It's a social utility. And, you know, a lot of people download the app. A lot of people delete the app. And a lot of people re-download the app. Because it's a tool. You just made a really good point there, and it's in the fact that I feel some people overcomplicate things. Mm -hmm. Simplicity is usually the best answer, but just thinking of the way you said that and like how it ended up being part of the latter part of your journey there, is it a lot of the stuff you learned early on a reason why you knew simplicity was going to be the answer there? You've already worked with other companies. You've been part of other, like, I think all the way back to leader, mm -hmm. like all of these different features you were banking on a lot of outside things Yep. with this one. It's simple. People are not going to stop using Instagram. Instagram stories are clearly here to stay. Yep. There's no reason why NGL would ever stop being part of that journey. There's no reason. Yeah. And you're right. I, I did take a lot of lessons from that, that, that first 
you know, that, that, that first chunk of time where I really learned like, okay, don't make this complicated, make this really simple. And like, just don't ruin it. I think a lot of people ruin things, you know, they ruin a good thing and they, and they overcomplicate apps. And there's so many apps that like, you know, we all used for many years and now we don't because a lot of the times they just added shit. They're just like, why is this here? Like, why, why, what, what are we, what are we doing? And I look, I look at Snapchat as a great example. Snapchat was my favorite app. And they added all this unnecessary stuff to it. And it's now this super complicated app and there's some feed and, and there's a map and there's all this stuff going on. It's like, I was just taking videos, like, you know, putting a little like sniper reticle and like sniping my buddy at, in high school. Like, let's get back to like that bar. That was funny. That was cool. So, um, yeah, I learned just like, keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate. And Snapchat's actually a really good example of that. Snapchat, at least when I was in high school, was the most viral app. I mean, oh, yeah. Everybody was sharing their snap. I didn't want your no phone number. or I wasn't yeah. going to follow you on Instagram. Like, what's your snap to everybody? Because yep. I wanted to see your stories. I wanted to see what you were doing. I wanted to see what people were up to. And it was the funny stuff, like the yeah. little sniper and all that. Love that. Now, I've never used snap maps in my whole life. Yeah. Why would I scroll the snap feed? Sometimes I'm, if I'm like really just in a deep, dark hole, deep click hole. on some of yeah. those like shows that are on Snapchat, but shit, that's like option number four. Oh, yeah. No, that's like, you've been on TikTok for hours. <laughs> you, you're just like, you're fried. You're just like, you know what? Let me tap on this shit. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And you, I mean, I, a lot of us churned from Snapchat, right? To use the, the term, like you just churned. Like, yeah. You just, all right, Literally. I'm out. And I mean, I look at it as. I like to build apps where if you churn on the first day, I don't really care because I've gotten something from you, yeah. whether that be I've monetized you or I've gotten you to share with your best friend or share publicly on one of your social medias. So it's like if you churn, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. And I think that people need to kind of build apps for like build this for like one person is going to use it one time and that's it. And like make sure the app can survive if like 90% of the people use it once. And I think that if if that's the philosophy, I think you'll build things that have daily retention because you'll be building for like really optimizing key moments. And like, you know, I call magic moments and like deliver the magic moment in the first 60 seconds, get something from the user, give them the dopamine in that magic moment, and then let them run. And if they don't want to come back, they don't want to come back. And if they do come back, that's amazing. We love that. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to put it. Like, apps like there's those apps that require you to be on them constantly i don't yeah. see those lasting that long because there's so many options it's tough to like keep people attached to one thing an app like ngl is so well positioned to just stick around and it's not gonna most likely blow up like it did but i could easily see us talking in 10 years and it's still putting money in your pocket because people are still using instagram younger generations are continuing to adopt the, the app so totally and I think it's great. I, 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 it's one of those apps that will, uh, it will just continue. And I, and I'm, I'm very, I'm very grateful, uh, for that because it was, I think it was the perfect app for me to have my first like big personal success. Um, because I was able to kind of like, I was actually able to profit. I was actually yeah. able to make money, which was, which was, you know, it's like, it's not as common in apps. Like it's like, you know, people are like, oh, we'll figure out money later. And it was just like for NGL, it was just like, no, we, we, we we cash flowed a million dollars our first month being viral. So it was like off the bat, it was like, oh my God, I went from <laughs> I went from like making a hundred thousand dollars a year to like I'm getting, you know, we're 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 bringing it every day. And it was just like, this is absolutely crazy. And, you know, it, it also was it's that kind of app that like it never really there was no cliff. It never fell off a cliff. It kind of always just like stayed. Like the revenue went up and then it just it never came down. And I'm super lucky that it, that it, that it, that it acted like that. Cause it was like, it was just a great experience for me to have. And I think that it like the goal that I had when I was starting in the industry was to build something that was like as big as that and like really cement myself and like, you know, define people's childhoods in a sense and their adolescence in a sense of like, you know, you building something that they use and, and, you know, the goal was, yeah, to build ask FM for, you know, now Gen Z and Gen Alpha uh, and I'm glad that we did that. It's kind of like a, a big check mark. And I'm like, I'm able to like, I'm able to know that that experience is like really strong and, you know, I can kind of put it on the shelf and, you know, look to the future. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's badass. You were part of a hundred plus million people's <laughs> social experience, crazy, which is crazy to say yeah. it out loud. 
Do you have any fun like win stories? Like, did you go and celebrate with people when it started blowing up? Did you do anything crazy? I feel like it's always fun to hear how people took in yeah. their quote unquote first big win. So, I um I did I I I I was like it's funny. I felt like there was there wasn't like a there wasn't like this like honeymoon phase. Yeah. It was we really just like we blew up and then every single news outlet in the world is writing about us and we're stressed out and we've got all these people that are coming at us and we've got now people cloning us and there's competitors and you know there's lawsuits and it's just like it, it was just like I got hit with a train so I think in the moment I there wasn't really that there wasn't like a celebration in the moment but months later yes there was when things had kind of calmed down and when like the ship was sturdy um yeah I I I uh I took some I took some trips I bought some things. Um, it was a it was a good time. I was able to kind of like do the things that I wanted to do, and you know, like fly first class and go somewhere nice, stay at a beautiful resort, and you know, bought some watches and a uh, car, and you know, just like kind of just made my seventeen year old self happy. And uh, yeah, that I but I there wasn't like a we weren't like jumping up and down. We were like freaking out, you know, <laughs> just like holy shit, this is like we, we have to just keep the app up. Yeah, and I think that's super cool because everybody always thinks it's sunshine and roses at the other side, but when there's success, there's usually a lot of people nipping at your heels trying to knock you down. The second you've got it, someone's trying to take it from you. That's that's really what it is. So it's like you, you just have to be aware of like, okay, it's go time. You know, yeah, we've made money. That's cool. But, you know, I'll tell you that I've, I've never felt more poor than after I, I made my first million dollars because I realized – Motherfuckers have eighty million dollar jets. <laughs> I'm out here, and I was like, they they're they're way above me. I'm nothing. I'm I'm a little speck. And it's like I think that that's where I get like a, a like a, a drive from. Is I'm like, you know what? Like I just gotta put my head down, and I just gotta run down my lane, and then I'll have an eighty million dollar jet, and then there'll be some guy that has a five hundred million dollar yacht that'll be like, damn, like that guy, he's got me. So it's like. If there's levels. There's there's so yeah. many levels to this game, and I think it's like you know when you're when you're trying to get your first dub, it's like you're just you're just looking down, like you're just looking at your feet, you're just you know climbing the mountain, and then you like pick your head up and you realize like oh my god, like the mountain is you know a thousand times taller. That's that's a great way to put that, and it's funny. It's that's a common theme when I interview people like you who have had a lot of success. It's hey. I thought that million dollars was going to be a game changer, but now all I can think about is 10. And the person that got 10, all they can think about is 100. And it's clear you're not going to kick your feet up, and NGL is going to be the last thing you do. You had a passion for crypto. You had a passion for NFTs. It was something you really did enjoy. Mm -hmm. You're now building something called Bags App. I see it. It went viral immediately. You're building it with somebody from the DGen community. Yep. What is that? How much can you share? Yeah, and 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 yeah, give us an insight on that. So I've always, I've always wanted to build in crypto and in finance and just build fintech. It was really just a matter of time. And um, really, what we're building at Bags is we're building the Discord Telegram replacement for financial messaging. I believe that there is a massive market uh, of people that are in alpha chats, that are in discords, that are in different groups all over the internet discussing finance. These people that don't really have a home. And similar to how, you know, apps popped up that would take communities off of Facebook and give them their own community and those apps did well. That's what we're doing for finance. And we're taking it on the angle of going at it through group chats mm -hmm. and more specifically through holder chats. So that's... Uh, that's like the next the next one. Hopefully, we'll have it ready soon. But uh, yeah, it went viral on Twitter. Very very unexpected. I mean, like I was I was like, wow, okay, that's great. And my co founder was like, let's let's talk about. it. I was like, you know what? Let's give him a little tease, and then it it uh, it worked. So just to make sure, I'm 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 hearing it yeah. right. It's like Discord where there's groups, and and I I that that was the industry I was in. I built Discords back in the day. Sneakers was such a popular area. I had built a few successful companies all around communities. So I got a taste for what it's like to build like a strong community. And 
is this like an application where I can subscribe to a community? Um, like, like there's an app store within bags, like, oh, I want to be part of this alpha chat. You subscribe. Is that kind of the gist of what it is or just a simple application where like-minded people will join group chats and chat? Yeah. The, really the, the, the basis of bags is if you own an asset, you are now in a chat about that asset. And that's kind of the level one of it. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of levels we can go from there. And, you know, there's a there's a long plan that we have for it of really becoming a massive on-ramp. Um, but it, it, it kind of starts with that key principle of like NFTs, crypto is built around ownership. We're building that directly into the app. But, you know, it's a crypto finance DGEN app. But you never see the word crypto. You never see the word NFT. You never see any Web3 words. It always drove me insane. I hated all of those. Cause, but I love the tech. Yeah. So I was, I was like the guy that was just like, the technology is the coolest thing ever. Like, oh my God. But like, stop being geeks about it. Like, stop being dorks. And like, you know, so with this Web3, like, no, no, no. It's, it's just tech, right? It's like people talking about NFTs and stuff. It's like, well... You know, I'm not talking about the, you know, I'm not saying, oh, go to my www dot into my website. Like, no, I'm going to say, hey, go to this is my link. It's like the people really, in my opinion, when it comes to crypto, were focused on like making the technology this like forefront thing. Where it's like, no, the technology powers this stuff. The, the general public doesn't understand how really any of this software works. I mean, I don't think anybody, most people don't understand how like TVs work and computers work. Mm -hmm. So it's like explaining you know ledger technology and you know blockchain and you know all, all this stuff it was just like no just give them a product that makes sense that you use the technology in the back end that's what we're really doing with bags yeah i i, I agree with you i actually thought that web3 was terribly packaged yeah. as like a term mm -hmm. because i come from a tech background as well the tech behind crypto and all of that whole realm is badass like yeah. it's cool but it was packaged in this Web3, Web3, Web3. And I don't think anybody even knew that there was a Web2 or that there was a Web1.0. Like, people just know the internet. Yeah. So, like, I thought it was extremely misleading and confusing. And I think that's why we got to this point where I don't see anybody tweeting about Web3 or anything. And that's where it was the most yeah. popular. But it's crypto is still popular. The technology and blockchain and everything they're using is still popular. It just needed to be repackaged into like not the most annoying buzzword I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you said you summed it up exactly right. And I, I, uh, I look at this. You know, very very few product people that I know are working in fintech, and I kind of looked at it as you know, I built the biggest anonymous app. I I did it. I checked that box. I want to build different shit. Mm. I want to be in a different arena. I want to be in an arena where the ceiling is much higher, right? The ceiling for an app like NGL is only so high. You know, I, you, can't, you can't get into the billion dollar club with an app like NGL. But with a financial app, with an app where there's more user data, where it's more valuable, where you're dealing with just like people that have more money to spend as well and you're targeting a different demo, the 10, 11 figure mark becomes actually possible. So that's really, that was kind of the main motivation of why I wanted to do fi financial apps. Um, and, you know, I still have my other social apps as well that I'm building, but that one I'd say is the, the, it's the main thing I'm working on right now. Yeah. And that was actually my follow up. Is that the only thing you're working on? Is there other stuff that you're building in the oh, back? There's other stuff. Yeah. And is that hush hush? That's hush hush. Yeah, bags is public, but uh, the other stuff is hush hush. Um, I have a I have a few different teams that are building some very exciting things that are social, but they're not anonymous social. I'm not building that kind of app again. Um, but building on the same thesis about sharing and about you know building really viral products through you know building loops and you know having it be this beautiful flywheel of. I bring someone and they bring someone and it just continues down. That's the philosophy um, in every product I build. It's just that I'm taking that to finance and then I'm taking it into other realms of social. And I look at, and I go all the way back again to leader and it's kind of the same thought process. Like you really tried to go at Instagram from the perspective of 
I'm going to do kind of the same thing, but give people a reason to share it, not just bet on them sharing it. Totally. And you've now kind of refined that all the way down into this flywheel of like, I know how to get people to share stuff. And that is the route to success in yeah. the world of applications. Absolutely. I mean, I think that if, if you're going to build any kind of app, the first question is, how does this grow organically? That's the question. And if you're not asking that question, you've failed level one. So I tell anyone that is a founder, and I, I, I advise a lot of founders, and I, I do a lot of work with, with a lot of companies, and many companies I work with have built number one apps and making millions of dollars, and I'm very proud of them because I'm usually always just kind of saying to them, why do you have that feature? Why is that there? How is this going to grow? No one's going to share that. This is lame. Like, I, it's very much like it's the same thought process, but like you, you just have to go through it many, many times and, and kind of not become cynical. I think it's more of like you have to really understand human nature. And I think that what I do is I'm really good at understanding human nature and, and how to get people to do things and how to get them to do things for you with like a smile on their face. And that's really what it is. It's like, you're sharing this app and you're making the developers of the app very happy that you're sharing it. And we're giving you this incredible feeling and making you feel like you're really cool for doing it. And it's this kind of like, it's a very fair exchange uh, in, in, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I think it is extremely fair. And I, I think when you look at an industry that has the best chance for virality, I don't see anything being better than an app because I mean, I think about it now, like there's still apps that come out that I talk to my friends and like you look at some of these companies like Supercell that has built some of these stickiest apps. Insane. Like just, I mean, everybody played Clash of Clans. Everybody. And then Clash Royale was a seamless transition. Like yeah. I don't know anybody yeah. who was like Clash Royale sucked. Like I wish they never did that. It was awesome. My brother is two years younger than me, still plays that shit and loves it. And like we have had. There's been multiple times where we've like, all right, let's get back into it and we'll play for a little while. And it's funny because it goes back to what you said on you don't need the person to constantly have it or be on it all the time. You just need them to want to come back when it's time. And like I look at Clash Royale and Clash of Clans, like I was all in in Clash of Clans in high school. Yeah, do me too. All in. Me too. And like I, I was Clash of Clans was like my eighth, ninth grade. That was it. It was it was like everything. My my yeah. high school had iPads, so it was oh like, yeah. What am I gonna do all day? I'm gonna play freaking Clash all day. Like, oh, and they had all the gem packs. Oh, and, dude, that I app mean, has taken oh, so bro, much money from me. Raped my dad's credit card. <laughs> Absolutely, like my, I would get I would get like, what is this charge for one ninety nine? Like I, I need the gems to level up my town hall. Like, yeah, dude. I mean that that's the thing with apps. Like we apps, in my opinion, I think apps are to like to us to this generation is like it's a pop culture like it's 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 virality it's what's trendy like like i mean we live on apps all day long like that like that's how we see the world is through an app so it's like if there's any industry that has the highest ceiling it's apps i mean like you look at how many you know hundred billion dollar apps there are i mean there's dozens of them um it's crazy and it's like and they're and they're all they're all on the same exact app store, and they're all abiding by the same rules. To tie it back to what we said in the beginning, they're all they're all doing the same thing because they understand that there's there's nothing like it. And I think that the golden age of apps is actually in front of us. I think that we haven't even begun to understand what that is what it's going to be like. I think that in about five years, when we all we're all wearing augmented reality glasses, and generative AI is extremely advanced, we're going to see things we've never seen before. And I think that's really going to be like, you know, take us back to like 2009, 2010, with like those beer drinking apps. And it's like, you know, and the fart noise apps, and everybody has apps, and everybody's making money with apps. It's going to be that on steroids in a couple of years. So everything I'm doing now is really just like, I'm going to build everything I want to build on, you know, on this phone, on this, you know, on, on the form factor of the phone before I switch to augmented reality and virtual reality. Well, I'm happy that I met you now. So in case I do have a badass app idea, there we go. I actually have some type of way to make it happen. Absolutely, uh, bro. And 
I actually agree with you. Like, I, I genuinely agree that there's still so much room in front of us for applications. I think the actual impact of phones has not even gone close. Yeah, absolutely. Because something that I think is interesting, like, I look at the phone from the first iPhone to now. Not that much has changed other than a better camera. Like, True. let's be honest. And we know these big companies, they won't stop making money. I do think there is a point that is coming very soon where the camera isn't the only reason why we use the phone. And I think other features and other ways to use the phone are going to be the selling factor. And I think it's all going to be on the back of applications. Yeah, absolutely. I, I And I, I think that uh, there's certain industries that I think will have radical shifts because they're going to have to now build for Gen Z and Gen Alpha. And, you know, now we're like, we're, we're, we're at the stage now where Gen Z is mostly out of college the you know half of gen zers are, are above above that age so it's only a matter of time till they have more disposable income and they represent a large percentage of the of the economy and you know gen z has no attention span so like i look at you know do i see the average gen zer filling out their taxes the way that millennials did absolutely not no, no way do i see them you know paying bills the same way no do I see them doing any adult activities the same way? Absolutely not. I think that there is so much innovation that's going to come in. And, you know, for me, I I, I feel very lucky because, you know, I, I really, I chose a very, very niche industry and I'm really happy I did because it, it it's definitely like, it's given me a, a tremendous insight and it's definitely, um, it's, it's also just fun. I, it's it's very fun, and there's a lot of people that work in industries that are just not fun. And it's like I'm always like, let's have fun, let's enjoy ourselves. Like you're building a business, it's, it's going to be hard no matter what. But like, if it's a little bit more fun, if it's entertaining, if you enjoy using it, it's like you're going to just much more enjoy your time in the trenches. Like you know, you're gonna you're gonna have a better time. A thousand percent. Yeah. At the end of every episode, I always ask a, a simple question, and you have a lot going on, so I'm, I'm, I'm no pressure, but I'm expecting a great answer. And it's, what, what are you excited about in the near future for you? You know, I'm honestly, I'll be honest, I'm excited to put my head down again. That's really what I'm excited for. I think that, uh, you know, the, the beauty of when you have your first win is that you can kind of chill for a little bit, pick your head up above the water and, you know, smell the roses. And I... Uh, all I want is just to put my head back down. So that's really what I'm most excited for. Um, as I'm in this phase now, I'm just like, I've got my next couple of businesses. We're nearly ready to release them. I understand, you know, how to do this. I just have to like put my head down for the next four to five years and I'll come out the other end as a multi-billionaire. And I know that the only way I'm going to do that is by building the correct app and a lot of my mentors are, you know, worth hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. And they all tell me it's just a matter of time. You just got to keep doing what you're doing, put your head down, just execute and just get it done. Um, and I, I, I really see it as like, that is the beauty of business. And it's the beauty of entrepreneurship is that like, this is, this is lifelong and you go through different phases. And I feel that like, my phase one was complete and it's like, okay, I did that. I did, I did the, the initial come up. The first mountain was climbed and now I'm sitting here and I'm at the basin and a lot of other entrepreneurs that I know feel the same way. It's like you have your first win and then you're like, you look up the mountain, you're like, holy shit. Like what the hell, like what am I going to, what, who, what kind of person am I going to be when I climb this mountain? Who am I going to become? Like it, it's, it's very scary. And I, I think it's like, your goals and your dreams should scare you. They should terrify you because really like the mountain is you, like you're climbing yourself. So like you want to be the best version of yourself possible. So yeah, you should be shooting for the absolute pinnacle life that you could never dream of. And if you just do that and you're also in an industry where like the ceiling allows that and you have the skill set where like, people gravitate to your skill set, you're valuable, people need your skill set. If you just kind of assemble all these pieces, dude, it's like anybody can do this shit. It really, it's it's really like, it sounds so chewy to say like it's a mindset, but it really is a mindset. Just like, I know that the people that created everything in the world are no smarter than me. Like 
everything we use is a product that someone else created. So why can't I build my own products? Yeah, and look, I've interviewed enough high level people to understand that mindset is like the yeah. main thing. Like yeah. whenever I ask what sets I'm you sure apart. They all say that, yeah. They all say it. Yeah. But something that's funny that you said that that's interesting. I've had so many people now on the show over the last few weeks from Miami, high level, all young too, have so much career ahead of them. I wonder who's going to be the first billionaire um, from the guests that I've had on the show. Like, I want to be able to look back 30 years from now and be like, that person was one of the people I interviewed. That's the first billionaire that made yeah. it from the batch of people that came through my show. Listen, I, I hope it's me. That's the goal. Um, Dude, I hope that, it's you too. That's always that's really always been the goal. And and it's I, I think it's not about money, really. For me, it's it's about like, I know what my young my young self wanted. And it's like, let's just like, just make my young self proud. That's really it. That's why I'm doing this. It's it's not about, I don't need money to to buy, you know, to buy expensive clothes and cars and just do live that life. Like I, I don't, I don't live like a hedonistic lifestyle like that. Like I'm, I'm here to really just build things that are just good for people that people like, that people enjoy. And um, yeah, I mean, my, my dad would always tell me, he's like, you know, don't chase money, chase your passion. Just make sure your passion can make money. That's really it. Dude, we're talking about a lot of stuff that's, there. That's a banger quote right there. Take that it's, one to heart. It's facts. It's facts. And he would always tell this to me. And, you know, I, I grew up and my, my parents weren't, you know, you know, we, we were well off, but we weren't, you know, we weren't balling. Um, you know, I, I went to private school, but I was, you know, the one kid in private school who lived in an apartment. So yeah, I had friends that lived in $20 million homes whose dads were driving Ferraris and, you know, it was like, I watched that. I was kind of like adjacent to it. And, uh, I'm so happy that I wasn't given, you know, a trust fund and I wasn't kind of just set up because, you know, it's like, you got to do it yourself. And I think like, you know, any young people, and I talk to a lot of young people and I'm just like, you know, it's good that when you start from not having help, yeah, it's good. And, you know, I, I wasn't raised poor by any means, you know, there was always food on the table and we took nice vacations. Um, but I didn't, I didn't live the life as a child that I wanted to give to my children. And really what I want to give to my children is an old money life and my, a life where they are traveling all over the world and they're flying private and they're going from the yacht to the helicopter, to the beach club, back to the yacht. And they're able to build businesses at 15, 16, 17. And really it's about, in my opinion, like everything I'm doing now is work hard. So I have a family that's fully protected 10, 15, 20 years from now. And then I can focus all my effort on just being a father. Cause I think that, you know, there's one thing to make the money, but you have to keep the money. And the only way you're going to keep the money is if you build a legacy and you build a family and you build a dynasty. And it's like, that's the only thing that matters. If your kid's a fuck up, yeah. your money's gone. Like, like it's a bit, so it's like very important. It's like, I talk to wealthy people and I talk to like, you know, mentors of mine, they're just like, who are now raising kids. And they're just like, yeah, it's all about just like making sure that they understand how to take this over and like actually keep going. And like, how do you, how do you vibrate at the frequency of abundance and then have the next generation do the exact same thing and, you know, be a family that is super wealthy for, you know, generations and generations. That's, that's everybody's goal. Right. So, um, I'm just thinking about it now. I mean, it's like a drop the mic and podcast right there, like yeah. powerful statement. I could, bro, I could go all night. So <laughs> I, mean, I, I go all, all the time, but, uh, but yeah, it's, I mean, I, I, I think that to kind of like round it off with, with leader and kind of take it back there. I, I'm glad you mentioned it. Cause it, it was definitely, I, I, I definitely look at that experience and I'm super, super happy that I tried. So it's like, if there's like anybody watching this, if you, if you're just like in the early stage, just go fail. I think that's the biggest thing I can say. Like, just go fail, just fall on your face. It's fine. It's not, no one's going to judge you. Like, don't worry about what your high school friends have to say about it. Like, it doesn't matter. Like really just, it, this is about just fail until you don't fail. And, um, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's been, it's been fun, bro. It's been great talking to you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I want people to be able to follow you and connect with you. What, and it'll all be linked below, but what are, what, what's probably the best place for them to connect with you on? 
Um, I mean, add me on Twitter. That's probably where I'm, yeah, most like active. Uh, and you'll, you'll put my link somewhere. So, uh, That'll be in yeah, the bottom of the video. Amazing. Um, yeah, Twitter, um, Instagram, but mostly I'd say Twitter. And, uh, soon there'll be some new, there'll be some new apps to use. So awesome, brother. It was a pleasure. I'm rooting for you now. I always sure, tell man. the guests at the end, like, I get to now root from a more personal level for the guests that come on the show because I feel like I'm kind of dedicated to like watching you succeed because I know your story from a more personal view. So super excited. Can't wait to check out all the stuff you're building. And thank you again for coming on the show. I appreciate you, man. This was great. We'll have to run it back. For sure. When next next apps. Next apps, we'll run it back. Absolutely. I love it, bro. Awesome. Thank you, man. Good shit, man.